Well, thank you so much, Candice. Pleasure to be here. First of all, I'd like to uh, introduce ourselves, and I think it makes sense for Ben if you'd like to go first. Oh, thank you very much. Hi, guys. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, I'm Ben, CTO and co-founder at Armo, and uh, one of the maintainers of, of, of the Cape project, um, taking part in the activity in, uh, in CNCF. Uh, and in my previous, you know, uh, uh, experience that I had was, uh, you know, white hat hacker for many years and went into cloud native later. And my name is Alex. I work as a director of Kubernetes at Canonical, the company that brings you Ubuntu and OpenStack and other technologies. Uh, I also work on the Open Feature Project, which is a CNCF sandbox project. I enjoy uh, collaborating with lots of communities and folks who are in the cloud native ecosystem. And I guess that's also why I'm here today, because um, you know my interaction with Ben and the Cubescape folks was really one out of native interest for, for hardening Kubernetes and security. And I suppose it was sort of a natural overlap that we had these intersecting interests. So just to get started on why we're here, I mean, Ben, do you want to take us through? This is a powerful statement that I picked out from this this uh, recent Gartner report. I mean, yeah. what do you feel about? It? Yeah, so honestly, it's um, it's a very strange, uh, you know, statement because when I first read it, I said that you know this cannot be okay. This sounds, I mean, very strange and futuristic, and and. Uh, and and then I started. It made me think. It was so you know unreal that uh, you know that actually it makes you think. Okay, of, of of what is here, and then you know I I looked at where is the industry today and where the industry is going. Okay, and and today we are in the in the you know after I can tell say today really that we after the cloud cloud revolution. Okay, we are in a place where where most of the uh, uh, things we as you know, application vendors, operators, uh, uh, people who are working in this industry and, and providing certain uh, computational services are doing are mostly related, okay, are defined by code, okay, right? And, and, and all these infrastructure components, which are the actual, you know, the computers and RAM and disk and all these things together are are provided by by you know other services you know which we love okay and and all the, these great cloud vendors are enabling us to to define all these systems all the things we need as code and if I'm thinking of this uh, of this again and and uh, of this statement and I see that well if the cloud vendor and we assume that the cloud vendor does his work right okay we all, usually I don't want to say brand names okay but we all know them and 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 we know that they are investing a lot of you know efforts into their into securing okay the infrastructure and, and and they have a lot of experience doing it so it means that that if where the things can go wrong is the place where we are defining okay what we need from this infrastructure and what we put above this infrastructure and these are you know Mostly coming from you know configurations, and this is why at the end when I after I thought it through, okay, this made sense, okay, and, and and you know I'm not going down to numbers, but 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 it is really the misconfigurations and the definitions going to be the core sources of of, of security breaches in the future. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I, I approach this from a from a product perspective. You know, I, I mentioned that I direct a Kubernetes engineering team. We build Kubernetes distributions. That's that's our bread and butter. And the more customers we see on board to Kubernetes and start to work with um, container orchestration, the more it becomes apparent that you get folks from all over the spectrum, right? So you get people who are super um, into low level components. They understand it in and out. Then you get teams who are just being mandated to simply move into containerization. And this might seem like a no brainer, but what this is introducing is a whole new set of attack surfaces, not just at the Kubernetes layer though, because of everything that Kubernetes is, is connected to, right? So using images, OCI images, they have um, a whole set of attack surfaces, the build pipeline and chains, the provenance. So it can be really overwhelming for folks to even start to think about this. And I love this diagram that we have put together for this, because I think that it illustrates two things. It shows a modern CI CD pipeline, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment, but it also shows the GitOps approach as well, which is starting to trend 
more towards um, the favorite way of, of doing reconciliation between your configuration, as you mentioned, and the reality. And if you think about this from a left to right, dev is the dream, release is the reality. It's almost the idea of you know um, the reconciliation showing desired state versus the actual state. So when I'm coding, that's my dream of what I want to create, and that's what my configuration is defined. And then as it goes through this, this machinery, it comes out into our cluster, and that's the reality. And so I think that this is the new attack surface because there are so many joints in it, right? There's so many moving parts. It's 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 almost the sort of analogy of building a rocket with, all, with the cheapest components possible. You've got to make sure that that, that cheapest component is still going to work to get you into space. Equally here, this might look secure if you use all the right practices, but there are many ways that these components weren't designed to work together. For example, uh, DDoSing on container registries. If that container registry goes back, many strategically um, many strategic clusters actually will have a fallback registry, which you can then um, manipulate the in-cluster credentials, or you can fetch the credentials from that fallback registry if you can use up the uh, or intercept the, the route. So just that simple example gives you kind of an, an idea, I hope, that there are so many different ways that we, we need to start thinking about securing uh, this new sort of challenge of CICD pipeline. I mentioned that it starts with the development environment as this dream of what you're building, right? But this really is where you start to introduce everything from semantic misconfigurations all the way up to um, not having the correct kind of testing or even testing in an isolated environment. For example, if I'm testing a SQLite database locally, but actually in the cloud, we're using a distributed SQLite database, and it, sorry, a distributed SQL database, it might work in a, in a very similar way. However, the credentials and the connection strings and the encoding and the security practices that I have around this may differ somewhat. And so therefore I'm already introducing the difference between the desired state that I'm creating and the actual state. And specifically around, you can see some of the icons around the, the Kubernetes side of things, around things like Helm configurations and YAML configurations. I'm opening ports for my application to work locally. I might not think about what that does remotely. A simple example of Kate's is setting host networking to true. That's something that people who work in Kubernetes might have done to be able to uh, obtain IP address or to talk to a host uh, system. It introduces a uh, vulnerability into that system. And even when you've got from your local built environment and you've started to push that up into your remote repository, Compilation doesn't necessarily mean that you're detecting vulnerabilities, right? A build being successful, whether that's a Python um, build of a, of a package or it's a Golang build, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're, um, you're free of vulnerabilities. And equally, many scanners, right? You might have a, a great sonar boy or, a, or a, another sort of scanner set up to, to, to scan for vulnerabilities. Many of them will use um, static configuration files that are scanning for, and they won't actually be looking for CVE vulnerabilities. They'll be looking more for, for sort of code compromises or even um, things around misconfiguration in the code or even optimizations. And then when you do get to actually employ detection tools at a larger organization, many of those will have soft warnings because if you're running 200 teams and they're using centralized tools, the amount of tickets that these tools create end up inevitably having humans that operate them turn those down to warnings because we don't have the people power to, to deal with that. And then the final part of this is that most base images you just fetch, right? From something, from Fedora, from RHEL, from et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We don't really think about where those base images are coming from. Now, I will lend a little shout out here to projects like Sigstore, which are thinking about provenance, but there's a long way to go between thinking about it and having it in reality for the majority of people in the cloud native ecosystem. And in the final part, as I mentioned multiple times, is that desired state is not an actual state. And if you've worked with Kubernetes enough, you'll realize that actually there's a drift that occurs in clusters when you start to introduce users playing around, you start to introduce um, different deployment mechanisms operating in the same cluster. Perhaps you have GitOps plus client side queue control plus uh, Helm as well. And so therefore, those differences, those drifts can be vulnerabilities. They can be made to exploits. Converting a cluster IP into a load balancer can easily give somebody an ingress into a cluster on the port 80, which is an unsecured HTTP port. Mm -hmm. So we have to be really sure that the actual cluster is continuously being reconciled and we understand what's going on in that cluster. And so the, it makes you ask the question when you're running a small organization versus a large organization, can we really afford 
not to improve these practices? What is the cost of building our CICD pipeline, but just kind of ignoring that stuff? It might be nothing. However, if you are a, an organization that has to comply to SOC 2, HIPAA, um, you're, you're running FIPS conformance, CIS conformance, and you're saying you're doing that and you're not doing it, it could be multi-million dollars. You know, it could be the loss of a contract. It could be a master service agreement torn up. So not doing these things can mean the loss of business and eventually the loss of your job. So it's 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 it very quickly spirals depending on the context of this question. But what I would say is that we need tooling to make this easy. But to do that, we really need to be able to consolidate this in a way that is digestible because it's so much, it's such a big topology. There's so many moving parts. Where do we even start? And I thought this would be a good opportunity for Ben. I want to get your take on kind of this idea of security gates. Yeah, so um, I think that, you know, you know, at the first stage, I think that we we, we really succeeded in frightening, okay, all the, the audience here, okay, about, uh, you know, how many <laughs> problems we have. But now we are still talking about the good parts, okay? That there we are safe, okay? We there there is a way, and, and not just there is a way. But I think that the way is much better, okay, than than what we have before, okay? I mean, in, in before cloud, before cloud native, before CI CD pipes, and so on. Um, and it really starts, okay, with with all these phases that you you mentioned, Alex, that that. You know when when we're going into uh, when we're talking about the development phase, okay, we we can hook up, you know, uh, um, really the the users, okay, of, of these tools, which are actually the developers, okay, and DevOps engineers and SREs, okay, who are who are writing Helm charts and YAML files and implementing applications and scripts and so on. What we what they are doing, okay, is it, 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 what we enable them, okay, can enable them is already tooling at this phase. This means that when they are starting to write something, okay, they get an immediate feedback, okay, which is awesome, okay, because if you have, think about this, uh, think about I, I, I'm just you know relooping to what you mentioned about the costs, okay. The costs of, of, of delivering something wrong to production, and I'm not talking about actual cost of you know of, of uh, actual security breaches. I'm talking about there was something wrong from a security perspective. We need to fix it, okay, before it, 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 there is a breach. The actual cost is is obviously the, uh, it's much higher, you know, if if it happens if it's identified down the road. And as close we are getting to. To the developer where the you know the inception is happening okay um the cheaper okay we can get up with it okay you mentioned okay uh, uh connecting the pod to the to the host network okay if it's done you know uh, uh without understanding what does it mean okay which is okay because no one not everyone needs to be a security expert and not everyone needs to understand everything but there this is why we are doing tooling okay if we can explain these things, for example, while the code is implemented, okay, the, uh, the solution can be very, very fast. And, and it's not just, you know, the actually hooking up in the development environment, okay, in the ID, in the, in the VS code or something, but even if we can hook into uh, the pre-commit hooks of, of, of local, of the Git repository and, 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 and you know, when, it, Someone tries to commit, okay, his work. Uh, you know, we are checking his work already. We have done a big leap, okay, forward. Okay, we already save a lot of time for work, uh, and, and we can deliver more secure things. The second thing is actually is, is the policy, okay, because for every for everything, and, and you will see that through this whole presentation in the in the sense that that there is something okay we are what we are doing in order to save ourselves time and money okay we are trying to you know notify you early but somewhere we need to enforce these you know these rules okay and if we are going through the first step okay of, of, of uh, for example of implementing a new hand chart okay the 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 developer had 
have you know committed it to his local repository. Now he's pushing it to GitHub, okay, and and creates a pull request, okay, for the maintainer of of the project. Now, okay, at this stage, okay, there can we can do two things, or we need to do two things. One is we have to check. In the pull request, whether just as you know, any unit test would happen, we have to check whether the new thing stands in the security standards of, of what we want to accept. So we are adding an action, a, 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 another gate, which is a hard gate, okay? Accepting only, you know, uh, secure you know, code into, in, into our repository, okay? Which is which is a, a you know a, in case of GitHub action okay it's it, it, it's really you know a, a, an action of a pre-check of a PR and we are not accepting the PR while okay the security issues are not solved or not uh, not decided that they are acceptable okay so Ben to interrupt you there would that yeah. mean that let's say I open a PR on your repository and I put like a host network true on the YAML file that would be a check that auto fails because that's a control that you would have on that repo right. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. And, you know, this obviously acts, this is something, okay, that, you know, an organization has to decide for himself, okay, uh, what, what is what is the security level, what is the acceptance, okay, there is obviously need to, uh, we have, there has to be here some, uh, I'm not sure that the word leniency is the, is the right word, but, but, but we have to be a little bit, you know, adaptable, okay, because otherwise, okay, we, we, we are creating, you know, problems for ourselves, which are not really worth it. But, but yeah, I agree with you. So this is, you know, the, this is really, you know, uh, the step where, where, you know, you, you have to decide how you want to handle these, uh, these events. So, uh, and, and the next step, okay, is, is also okay when after you have committed, for example, your 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 YAML definition. Okay, you have to look at uh, at the images you are using. Okay, in your Kubernetes deployments. Okay, so they're coming obviously from a container registry, and 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 you know you can you can uh, check you know container images for for vulnerabilities, uh, you know ahead of time, uh, and and, and Look them into okay during even the build phase okay of container images, but there is a slight problem with that. Okay, first of all, it's good practice. Okay, and it's also security gate. Okay, but it is also important from day to day to re scan your uh, your images in your container registry. Why? Because every day there are new security vulnerabilities found in different projects. Okay, which are which might make your container uh, be part of your container images. And, and if you have scanned your container, like, you know, uh, even a, a week ago, and you, uh, for example, you didn't get any new uh, critical vulnerabilities, you might say, okay, it's fine. But what if there is a new critical vulnerability, you know, found, you know, two days ago and was published. And now if I'm rescanning the same image, I will do find this, uh, this specific vulnerability. This is why this, is, uh, this cannot be a single, you know, a single event, event, okay, in your, uh, in your processes. You, need, you have to be, uh, you have to rescan your containers, you know, every time there is a new release of, of list of vulnerabilities in order to be able to understand what you have. And, and the last step, obviously, okay, after you have deployed, you know, uh, from your your code repository, you have deployed uh, uh, your code, and, and and you know your images went into the cluster. Okay, you have to still recheck, be able to recheck. Okay, uh, 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 your clusters and your you know and your workloads always. Okay, because again, you went through a few already three gates. Okay, but. But what if you know there uh, there is someone who was able to bypass one of these gates, okay? And uh, and as you you talked about you know the different tooling, okay, and and different ways how users might get into a cluster, uh, even you know legally, okay. But uh, but also you know the same thing with with new vulnerabilities which are happening, uh, which are being found every day, and you know new issues which are raised. So as after your deployment. You still need to uh, to get you know you be on top of this all of these things, and the great good thing is that the tooling is there. 
It's interesting because the, the the emphasis on the gating is is sort of like um, I guess locks on a dam or, or on a river, right? In that you need to go through them, and only once you've gone through every one and they've all passed can you continue to production. And I think that it sounds really simple that that kind of idea, but it's it's an ideology, it's a philosophy that engineering team can get behind, right? They can understand that, right? Okay. These are the checks that have to be green. This build has to be green. Because once you start speaking the language of product engineering teams who are just looking to deliver their workloads on top of Kubernetes and build them a pit of success, it's like what I was talking about at the beginning of this, of this webinar. It's, it's about making it so easy that the alternative is unthinkable, right? Because it's, it's like, we don't have to do anything, right? These gates are here. When they go red, we know something's gone wrong. Otherwise, it's straightforward. And that's our path to success. Yeah. At least that's how I see it, right? Yeah, completely. And also, it's it's also about empowering. Okay, empowering. Okay, you know, the developer to 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 know about these things and and you know save himself and everyone as many time as much time as he can. It's also sort of an interesting one um, because I think that when we start to think about the security tooling, I mean, looking at this sort of complex distributed multi-substrate environment for CICD, right? Because you could be building on one thing, you could be deploying on another. It really comes to mind that there needs to be some sort of way of aggregating this, right? And the ability to sort of start to bring this all together. And I know that you and I have talked about, this is why Kubernetes is becoming so popular is that it seems like the POSIX of, of, of cloud native in that it's an interoperable layer that people can build on. But also it means that, that it's becoming the greatest attack surface that, we, we, that, that we've seen in recent years. So. I guess that with all of this focus on case, building a single pane of glass to monitor all the ingress and the egress and the, the continuous reconciliation and all those other steps we described seems to be something that's just inevitability. And what I wanted to get you to talk a little bit more about on this slide was sort of those, the, those characteristics or those things that you think are really important in these pane of glass to really help people on this journey. Right. Right, so so I, I think that that you know um, one of the you know you can look at you know the the, the single pane of glass okay of, of, of something that that is uh, is you know uh, combining some different you know subjects uh, you know under one hood okay but but you can also think of of, of having a single pane of uh, of the same thing across a, a multiple you know stages and 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 and. I think that beforehand we talked about you know tooling in different you know stages. Now we're getting into uh, you know of talking of of of, of uh, single pane of uh, single pane of glass across you know different uh, um, subjects and themes. And, and and really okay the the I think that that really what you know is important is to bring all these things under one hood because security is at the end, okay, is, a, is, is one question, okay. Is the attacker able to, to penetrate? Is there a problem or not? And, and I can tell that I'm, I'm using, you know, 12 different tools, okay. And I worked really hard, okay, to implement them. But but at the end of the day, okay, I still uh, you know I, I'm still managing twenty tools and, and and there can different things can fall into the, between the cracks. So so really okay, the the the, the having a single uh, uh, you know solution which is, brings you through the whole journey, okay, between image vulnerabilities, which is uh, more closer to what we are uh, running inside the Kubernetes cluster, to workload uh, configuration and API server. Uh, access and th their interconnection, okay, because these things are, are, are you know, are affecting each other, okay. Uh, I can give you a very simple example, okay. If a workload is a uh, public facing workload, you talked about load balancers and ingresses, okay, right. If it's a workload which talks, gets traffic from, from the public internet, obviously it's security, is, we look at its, its security in a different way than. Then you know workload which is you know uh, you know gets your CPU metrics one uh, one time a day okay behind the scenes for uh, for your knowledge so um, having this interconnecting also this information is also very important and it's very important to you know for the users to to enable them to uh, uh, to have one tool instead of uh, or one platform instead of of 
like you know uh, uh, 12 twin uh, or more different platforms and i think you've reminded me of two things i think having a single platform gives you an ability to educate that's the first thing is that a lot of security issues are around education around learning what is a good practice versus one that leaves you vulnerable but the other thing that i think is very interesting is that having a single pane of glass enables you to perform a level of forensic analysis you can look across your cluster and look at the vulnerabilities over time you can look at your r back you know you can start to perform deeper introspection and evaluation of, of potential issues and potential controls that are that are you know that are that are being um the bidding being flagged and i think that you're right like when you do have a bunch of different tools it, it you can do it but it just makes that a much more cumbersome experience and then what happens if you're working with five other professionals and you need to reproduce that effort or say hey look at this i mean everybody i'm sure would be familiar with projects like grafana where you can just simply send a link to a to a dashboard and say are you seeing what i'm seeing here right and and there's sort of a level of collaboration um which i think is super interesting right and, and so I, I guess this is really where we wanted to or i mean you especially wanted to talk about how cubescape effectively covers some of this stuff and so i wanted to do a bit of a demonstration in a moment but do you want to run us through this sort of high level of how does how does an open source tool like cubescape cover your bases across these security gates so yeah um so cubescape is you know um an open source Kubernetes security platform, okay, which uh, we started from, you know, from our, we went to our customers and we wanted to understand what are their problems, okay. I, most of our customers were going into, were new to Kubernetes and went into Kubernetes, and and they said, well, I'm I, I'm I'm just you know functionally I was able to build my first you know system in Kubernetes, but I don't know if it's secure or not, and. And you know this is where the project started more than a little bit more than a year ago. Okay, that that you know understanding okay of, of different Kubernetes objects where you have misconfigurations inside them. But but I think that 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 after you know after a few few from um, first few months okay where we when I have to tell here again okay that we got a huge love from the community and and, and which was awesome okay and and, and really made us think of of, of made us continue okay this down this road is uh, is that we created a kernel of of, of, detect, of understanding kubernetes objects creating policies around uh, them using uh, uh, opa open policy agent uh, uh, language okay and detecting uh, uh you know misconfiguration issues around uh, you know around uh, kubernetes objects and we saw very fast that it's not just what we, we have to look into what you have in your Kubernetes cluster. Okay, what are the deployments? But you know, people and ourselves want to look into the same objects on the left side of, of the screen, also already in the dev and, and, and the pre-deployment phases. And, and, and this is why we created it in a way the kernel that is portable, and we are, we are able to, to add this, uh, uh, you know, this kernel, this knowledge. We can distribute it along the different phases, okay, we've been talking about, and we can edit uh, in the development phase, in the git repo phase, in, uh, and later on when we added the uh, image scanning uh, capabilities, okay, we added also the image scanning inside the cluster and also in container registry, which was our uh, uh, container registry spanning, which was our uh, you know third gate, if you recall that before. So, uh, this is we, uh, the way we created Kubescape to be able to uh, to be able to be portable by design and be able to you know stuck in those different phases uh, for the user because we understand that they need to, uh, this knowledge in all of these phases. One of the things that was interesting to me as well in this diagram is that Kubescape is also on the Grafana icon. Is is observability a, 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 an important thing for you? Yeah, I think that that you know. Uh, First of all, Prometheus and Grafana is, is is such a you know such a great project, okay, and and really enables you to to create security dashboard uh, for yourself, okay, for your company, and and you know observe security over observability is is really important. Security must have observability, and I think that you know any maintainer, any kind of, of life system knows that it goes 
both ways. So there's no real observability without security. So it was really given from the beginning, okay, that that that, that you know this that data has to be also in, in the Prometheus Grafana space as well. That makes a lot of sense. And I've had a chance to play around with Cubescape for a while. I mean, I actually run it on several of my clusters. Um, what I wanted to do in this segment was to just sort of run you through some of the things that I found interesting uh, and, and really kind of, I guess, to pick Ben's brain whilst he's in this webinar as well around kind of the motivations behind them. So I'm going to share my, my screen here and please do mention in the chat if there are any issues, you should be seeing a VS Code screen uh, of some example code. So I've got a very simple piece of YAML and for those of you who are in the Kubernetes space, you'll know that this is a, a deployment for a simple pod uh, for Nginx. This is typical of what you might find uh, in a Git repository. You know, you have some organizations that centralize their YAML files, but I think um, in the majority, people tend to package their, their code with their YAML in the same project. Now, that, that, that definitely is, is down to opinionation. Now, what's interesting here for me is that you have this idea that with when you're in VS Code, you get your kind of linting errors. Now, what was really cool that I like is that when you do something like, as we described earlier on, you set something like host networking, you instantly get this, um, th th this, this warning that comes up. And what's quite interesting about this is that the warning says, hey, you know, setting this up is, uh, is not a great idea <laughs> because effectively you are, you're allowing uh, this pod to have access to the host network. And I like as well, then you can go on and find, you know, sets of more information about it. And I think that as you described, and as we've been talking about, Throughout the course of this conversation, education is the first step, right? Having some education around, oh, okay, well, I didn't know that, right? I didn't, I didn't know that was a, that was a good or a bad idea. So, for me, when I'm onboarding new engineers who have to, for example, in my world, build an operator and they're writing YAML, they might be writing a service or a deployment. Just knowing these little tips around this might be something you've got to think about rather than just do is super useful. I mean, hands up if we've copy pasted a YAML deployment before, right? Like everyone does it. And I think sometimes you copy something from Stack Overflow, wherever it might be, and you have this thing in there, you don't know what it is. And you, and you look at it and you're like, well, I'm just running that CPU serve, that CPU ticker you mentioned. Maybe it's not the best thing to do. So removing that, and I always think it should be like least privilege, right? You need the least amount of configuration too, should be the kind of philosophy is a really important approach to this. So I'm going to switch back to my browser now and show you something else that I like. So that's the development journey that I really like. It's super easy to use. Now I'm going to change change gear and change tab here and put cats. Cats is a, uh, a simple repository which shows you pictures of cute cats. This is a lot like your typical Golang based Kubernetes repository, right? You got your package with your with your code in here, and you've also got templates. That form your Helm chart. Helm is a popular tool. There are lots of other popular tools. You've got customize, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now I wanted to introduce a way of actually passing my my repository, my configuration, to see what happens. So what I did was I used the Cubescape workflow, right? Which is like you know what squiggly. It's eighteen lines, super simple. So by introducing this, what happens here is that I get a scan that then interpolates through JUnit to give me some meaningful action output. And what's quite cool about this is I can choose to make this either pass or fail, but what you will see is that I do get the um, annotations coming back as errors from uh, JUnit saying, hey, by the way, in your deployment here, chief, you've got some problems. Like, for example, here, uh, privilege escalation, I've got uh, resource limit, you know, there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And if I was, not in a demo environment, I would most certainly have this as a fail, right? Like we described, you, you, you pick your controls, you pick your exceptions, and, and I think that's a, a really interesting one. I mean, is out of those two things I've explored so far, do you think there is kind of a prevalence for one or the other? Are you starting to see people use these in conjunction? They'll use the local um, sort of implementation on, on VS Code and also the GitHub Action, or is it kind of more of a one or the other sort of approach? So um, I think that, you know, the answer is lies around a little bit of, of everything, okay? Because I met guys who, who you know, who said that, uh, uh, well, okay, I 
I just want to hook this up in uh, in my you know in in my uh, uh, PR action, okay? And 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 you know if if he needs to solve it, he will solve it there. I I, I you know I will you know this is what I where I'm coming from. And you know I I met some of the guys uh, you know who said well you know uh, VS Code is everything, okay? And and, and if I have it in VS Code, I'm fine. And I I met. Uh, uh, you know, a team leader uh, from a company who said that they are using both. And I think that, that somewhere the answer is comes from uh, uh, what is the right thing is, is, is really depends on who you are and what you're trying to achieve. But because in general, okay, maintainer, okay, of a project will add it, this to his, you know, to his uh, 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 PR actions, okay? That's and a good point, we'll, yeah. Yeah, because this is how he's gating. He, this is how we are. He's protecting. Okay, his his stuff, and and those developers who are very you know security uh, savvy and, and 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 want to work ahead of time. Okay, they want to sell it. Well, I will. I know that what I'm going to do is right. Okay, because you know I'm the king of the castle. Okay, and. And what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to this into VS Code and I'm fix inside everything. And you know there comes those who are working in an organization, lo looking all of these phases in one, you know, in a single pipeline and not just different phases. And 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 will say, okay, I will for that for sure I'm going to put this into you know into the repository as a you know as a gate. But I always tell, but I will also tell my team guys use this plugin, okay, because you know it will save us time. That makes a lot of sense. And actually, you reminded me of something. I just wanted to segue before I show the last part of my demo. I've I've been using um, Cubescape as part of the Open Feature Project. So there's a there's a tool called uh, CLOMonitor.io, you know, and CHCF projects um, get monitored by this. And what's interesting is that, you know, I was the, the author of Flag D and the Open Feature Operator. So I have to, the, the blame lays at my feet here somewhat. And that we have a 69 out of 100 score. And what I'm going to do off the back of working with Cubescape is that a lot of the stuff that is being flagged around our, our, our YAML, our dependencies, um, you know, and stuff that, that we described in the BS Coast. So for me, there's like a real incentive to add this in because this is a health check for our project. So yeah. As we showed, you know, in this action, maintainers do have a stake in this, right? And maintainers want to keep the hygiene of their projects really high, especially if they're working under the umbrella uh, of the Linux Foundation or one of its uh, one of its sister organizations. Right, for sure. So uh... the, the last bit I wanted to show was the bit I was holding back because it's the bit that still gives me the wow moment a lot. Is um, I love I love using the the, the Cubescape SaaS solution. Because, well, I'll tell you why, there's a few reasons, but one of which is that I have a bunch of different clusters that I monitor at any one time. And as we've described so far, it's kind of been on that single track journey, right? It's always been for like APR against a repo for a cluster. Now, of course, if you want to go multi-cluster, you need to think about that, right? I, I, I was really interested as well, especially with you on the, call, uh, on the, on the webinar, Ben, to get kind of your, your thoughts around what Cubescape Cloud means to you and to your users. And what was sort of the incentive to build, you know, we spoke about this single pane of glass, but what was your incentive to, 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 to really build this out? Because it feels like it's just something that brings together what we were talking about earlier on. Yeah, so so really, okay, uh, uh, the Cubescape Cloud project, okay, which is our Armos, part of our Armos SaaS solution, okay, today, is is really, you know, uh, a way to, to, uh, to Bring you all to this, you know, all to this. Bring you all this information you're collecting in different phases, okay. Enable you to uh, uh, not just, you know, to see the results in, a, you know, in a graphical way and get get understand faster, okay, of, of, of your security issues. But also later on, okay, also to interconnect, okay, these features. So, um, you know, Cubescape is, is is really, you know, a uh, 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 a very young project, okay, but but we are already, you know, building things where we are trying to connect all these information sources, okay, together, and and this is gonna, uh, the place where we can do it, okay. This is where we can bring information from your production cluster, from Cube API, together with your vulnerability information, 
uh, you know, using your cloud, uh, uh, your accessing your cloud API and reading, you know, some of the cluster definitions from there, and you know, showing these things uh, uh, together to you, and also to prioritize. Now, what you know, this is already you know, you can use it today. This is uh, uh, today. This is a free uh, project. You know, your service you can access. But as we are going to forward, okay, we'll bring more interconnections, okay, between these data sources. And, and you know, we are really looking into this as a, as a single pane of glass, okay, giving you a single security solution for 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 Kubernetes, okay, and and getting uh, um, getting you not just as I told before, okay, not just single pane of glass for from different you know subjects, okay. Uh, 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 of the Kubernetes security, but also from different phases, okay, of your security, okay, Re scanning your repositories, scanning your uh, uh, your container registries, uh, uh, scanning your clusters, uh, and so on. And and I think that this is this is the way, okay, we want to work. Okay, we don't want uh, if we need to, we are building, uh, you know, uh, solutions from different parts. But but if we are talking about security, I I think. And my philosophy is that that you, if you are putting the, together too many things, there will be things which which will fall between the chairs, and uh, and, and you need something that covers you uh, from you know from left to right, and yeah. and keeps your cloud is meant to be that. I am um, I trying to do some justice here by putting some takeaways together. What I, as an end user and as a uh, as a product engineer who builds things in this grand cloud ecosystem, has taken away is CI/CD security is particularly challenging. Right, there's a bunch of stuff you got to consider in all these moving parts, and safeguarding that system is critical for not only commercial leads but also, as you've described, for the a maintainer of a project, for your credibility, for your ecosystem, and you're actually protecting your end users as well. And I really like this kind of, it's too easy not to approach. I call it a pit of success. And I, 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 I believe that I'm, I've taken that from somewhere. I have to remember where that quote was from, but I love that idea of like, it's so easy, the part, you know, you, there's, there's no reason not to. And I think that that's one of the things that I've really liked about it. Um, in particular, you know, when we're building operators, whether it's open feature, whether it's, you know, for my work, I like the idea of being able to have engineers who are like, oh yeah, I caught this thing, you know? And they can say, oh yeah, this is something that's come up. Let's go fix that. Not this kind of sentiment of dreading pushing something to the build phase and you know, seeing it go through, actually becoming more familiar and more comfortable with it. So I think that's really nice. And I'm just really happy that I got to, to talk to you about it today. And so I don't know if you wanna give any closing thoughts um, or, or anything you wanna share before we, before we finish up. Yeah, I think that, that the only thing, okay, you, I think you, you've summarized it so great, but, but, you know, really just my takeaway for you guys is also to, to, to really see this as really as an opportunity to, be in, in, to improve, okay, CICD, although it, it opens up a lot of security questions, okay, uh, uh, but, but it can also make these the security questions disappear even more if we are Working a little bit more methodologically and 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 and, and, and using the, the right tooling and and the right approach, I think it's a it's a great opportunity for uh, for all of us. And I, would, you know, just like to echo the sentiment that I'm excited as as, as mentioned at the beginning of the call, you know, contributing as a tech lead that this is now a maturity point in the cloud native ecosystem that we're seeing these tools starting to address some of the gaps. Uh, in our in our our tapestry of cloud native projects, and it's great to see that it's becoming so easy to use that we're, we're lifting each other up and becoming more secure by design. So, again, thank you for indulging me on my questions, Ben. Um, and with that, I will hand back to uh, Candice at the uh, Linux Foundation. Thank you so much, Ben and Alex, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.